Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Nana Reisinghani. I'm one of the product managers who work on the M project, but more importantly, I am a facilitator for the UI and accessibility working group, um, as well as the code of conduct working group. Um, so if you have any questions in any of those two spaces, um, I would have said find me later physically, but like just like chat me on Slack or something and we can talk. Um, but yeah, my the, the, the way I'm structuring this talk is roughly talking about AMP as a service or like really how we're thinking about AMP websites in 2020. Um, I know that this is halfway through the year, but with a lot of the changes that have come about due to like COVID, um, as well as like page experience announcement, I think like this is a really good time for us to like really think about what, what do we want to do for the rest of 2020 as well as 2021 and beyond. Um, now it should shock none of you as web developers um, that investing in the web can be incredibly critical to any kind of business's success, right? It can mean actually making a profit that year or actually having engagement with your users. However, again, uh, every web developer says that they're finding web development more difficult as time goes by. Um, in 2019, Mozilla Developer Network actually like got a sent out a survey that received about 30,000 responses. And these were some of the 15 top pain points that web developers said that they faced with web development. Uh, the most interesting thing here to call out is the fact that they find everything from actually testing code to like actually deploying it in a scalable fashion problematic. So it's like once you've written the code, that's the easy part. It's actually everything else that seems to be the more difficult part, uh, which really speaks to like how obstacle driven web development has become in 2020 or like even in the years before. Um, and the great thing about us being web developers is that these are all issues that AMP developers face as well, which means we're in a good position to actually help developers with this if they're using AMP because we have the empathy and we have the team to do so. And so when we started AMP off and like, um, when we started AMP off, the idea, the guarantees that we were trying to pro uh, provide developers with was the fact that it would always be up to date, right? Every week without um, a developer having to do anything, they would get this new release, which had all of this AMP goodness. And now in 2020, you get it. You can even choose to get that every month if you want the more stable release. Um, we also said that the uh, AMP pages would have increased speed and reliability by default as compared to non-AMP pages. And we also said that obviously monetization and being able to earn revenue from your web presence is incredibly important to you e-commerce or news publishers. And we wanted to support all kinds of uh, revenue model generations on the web. And the most important thing was that we were an open source framework. And hence that meant that anyone who had, who felt that AMP was missing something or wanted to contribute to make it better was absolutely empowered to do so. And all the work that we've been putting in over the past years have like actually yielded in, in us showing success, right? We've seen things like, we've seen news publishers see that um, their pages load much faster and that means that users are spending more time. They're actually like clicking on ads, even engaging with them. They're spending more time on the page as well. And it just like even going from one AMP page to another and they're spending a lot more time engaging with this much faster performing, much higher user experience um, content as well. And so all of the work that we've been putting in as a team has been seeing success on the other end. And that's something we should all feel incredibly proud of. Um, but however, while th that's the goal we started off with wanting to help developers with making web development easier, over time, like actually building AMP pages has become, has, has also uh, started to pose a few challenges. Um, the largest one is obviously picking between what we call paired AMP when you have a canonical page and an AMP equivalent on that page which is like has this really ongoing like dual page, uh, page maintenance cost, right? Every time you change a template, not only do you have to go change your canonical page, you now have to go ch change your paradigm page. And if they get out of sync, that's frustrating as well. And then on the other hand is the fact that AMP first, which is us asking you to power your entire site with AMP is not really, is not really capable, especially like if you look at like we as a team of let's say even 1,113, which sounds very impressive can't solve for all problems that every vertical is facing. And so that will always mean that we won't be as feature rich. And which means when you are choosing to pick AMP first um, at the start, like you, you did have some problems associated with it. And now with things like AMP script, that is becoming easier. But once you also picked the model that you want to support the paired AMP or AMP first, you've also noticed some other problems that kind of come from that. You'll see that AMP's performance on origin can sometimes be lacking. Um, and the fact that, it, and that means that yes, developers are pushing towards the AMP cache. However, the cache comes with its own like 
programming difficulties, which like people aren't really used to like thinking about the thinking about a, a user transitioning from cache to origin. So like all of these add these own programming complexities. And like I said, like creating incredibly interactive experiences with AMP can be sometimes difficult because we don't have like the first party component support for all of it. And over time, especially in the past two years, we've we've really received feedback that a lot of uh, the, the story of how AMP is compatible with other frameworks and other CMSs is really unclear and has is lacking. And so that's what we really want to invest in in 2020. Um, so like the TLDR is that developers find that all of the added benefits that AMP does give sometimes will outweigh its benefits. And in the context of all of this, you've also had the page experience announcement, which Malta and Joey shared talked about, but I'll just re -talk, it, talk about it again in case someone's joining this call right now. It's, it's a new ranking factor in that Google search has announced very specific to Google surfaces um, that basically builds up on the three core web vital metric, which is loading with, uh, from largest contentful pane, first input delay, and then uh, look, looking for visual stability while cumulative layout shift, and then some other pre-existing signals such as mobile friendliness, safe browsing, HTTPS, and like interest, and like reducing in bad interstitial ads. And all of this kind of contributes a signal to search. Um, and all of these are grouped together in what is called the page experience ranking signal. So how are users perceiving this page and are they finding um, the experience great? So in light of all of this, what does 2020 really look like for AMP? Um, Malta and Joy alluded to this, but the real focus that we're putting into AMP is to like really have developers perceive AMP as a service. And what does that mean? It means that when developers are choosing to use AMP, and this can be in conjunction with a framework, CMS, or just using it by hand, they're choosing to pick the most cost-effective and simple solution that can help them create a great page experience, which means that once they've done like some kind of setup, which is like everything you have, you always have to set up a new framework or set up a new library. But once they've put that effort in, their ongoing costs are minimal, right? And you've got this really great pit crew of engineers that are actually working on converting your page, making it fast over time and like converting it into a great AMP experience. Now the difference, I picked this analogy and then I realized a problem with it is, um, if you're a Formula One driver or a NASCAR driver, you come to the pit crew, so you upgrade your dependencies and then your page becomes fast. But like having an AMP page is like having the pit crew just travel with your car and upgrade it like every time they realize something's wrong with it. So imagine not having the pit crew pit stop. And that's, this is the only lame joke I will crack this entire time, I promise. Um, but the real idea with AMP, the AMP as a service is you get all of these great things that you found problems with, you get them built into your AMP experience. You get performance building, you get image optimization built in, accessibility, user research, infrastructure, testing analytics. We're solving, we're trying to solve as many of these problems for you so that once you've done the setup cost, as, as long as you're integrating new components, AMP is taking care of the iterative performance imp improvements once a week, once a month, hell, even once a night if you want to you know, live dangerously. Um, but yeah, like that's what I've been talking about. The fact that once you have this initial setup, which is you either decide, hey, I want to be served from an AMP cache, or you know what, I'm going to be served from origin, and so I'll use things like AMP Optimizer, which Joey talked about, and I'll pair it with a CDN. That's your initial setup cost. But then the ongoing effort has been done by the AMP team, right? We make sure that your extensions are performing well, um, be, and that's across a bunch of metrics such as infrastructure, accessibility, performance. And we're also making sure that the runtime is like making sure that these work, these extensions work together great. And all of this results in like a happy developer who's had to do a one-time setup cost and has to do minimal ongoing um, iterations on it. Um, but remember the challenges that we said were like with the way AMP is implemented, which is like having to pick between paired AMP and AMP first. Well, the thing is, as long as developers are picking paired AMP pages, they're always going to be slightly more unproductive because they are going to have to think about these dual maintenance costs. And so these are the sets of problems that we have to think about, right? Paired AMP pages, um, the fact that uh, paired AMP pages, cache, et cetera. And so that's really what we're thinking about in 2020. The idea with AMP as a service is once developers put in the initial cost, um, put in the initial setup time, we want them to be more productive over time as they um, and make sure that they don't have to invest a lot of effort into this. So how can you all as the 1113 AMP contributors help here, right? That's, that's what we're all here about. Um, and the idea is like, like I said, we want to make AMP development easier and that can start from like creating a great page experience as, as dictated by Google or just more generally as well, allowing developers to create more complex experience, making sure that monetization is, is as strong in AMP as it would have been if they hadn't picked AMP making sure that if they decide that they don't want to invest in a cached experience, that even their experience on origin is equally fast. 
and you know, having a much clearer story for frameworks and CMSs, but also helping developers meet their infrastructure needs over time by maybe not having to think about infrastructure at all. And as this whole privacy and security landscape changes, even in 2020 um, with CCPA and other announcements like this coming out, making sure that we are supporting developers through this um, sometimes confusing journey. And all of this with an underlying incredibly great user experience by baking in some really great components as well. So let's try to think about like some of the pieces of efforts that come into all of these um, and like actually delivering on all of these. Hopefully none of these are new to you. Um, if they are, let, like we can talk about it in a Q&A if we have time. But yeah, um, to actually create, allow developers to create and then maintain most importantly, these great page experiences over time, we have to continue investing in AMP's performance. Um, Malta said that the web, about 20% of the web was doing well, well against Core Web Vitals. A large part of it is AMP, but we have, a, we have a long way to go and we have to keep investing there. We also want developers to have flexibility in how they can use AMP, right? If they want to be served from cache or if they want to be served from origin, allow them to pick the pieces of AMP that they feel like will make them most productive instead of like forcing a fully AMP first zero to valid AMP model on them. Um, and also once developers do find performance issues, we want to help them, we want to be there for them and help them debug these performance issues. And this could be like having them, um, having them be able to diagnose what is wrong with their AMP page and then like be able to file a bug on GitHub and have a good response time there. Um, for creating more complex experiences with AMP, uh, this was alluded to in the previous talk, but really Bento is, is, is our bet there, right? Allowing developers to say, hey, I really want, I really like the carousel experience that AMP offers, but I think that the payment support that um, like, you know, this other vendor provides is much better. So I'm going to mix those two together. So that flexibility allows them to create a, lot, a larger variety of um, interactive experiences. And then if they feel like, hey, you know what, I just have this 10% need that I really think I can get done if only I had JavaScript in AMP. Well, we've got AMP script for that. And the idea there is to like, just increase support for AMP script over time as we see that, hey, maybe this DOM API that developers are looking for is missing and adding support for that over time. Um, improving per page monetization. Um, we launched AMP Next Page, which is support for like page level infinite scroll. So if you finish reading an article, if you're, uh, if you're on a new site, the other article just automatically loads and then you can keep reading more related content. We launched support for that um, earlier this year and we're gonna keep, uh, if anyone has bugs or anything, feel free to follow them. We'll keep looking at it and improving support for that. But we're also looking to support more custom ad formats, right? As a, within AMP's design principles of really putting user first content first, we want to research and explore more custom ad formats and see how that fits into like AMP's design principles as well. Um, we, like I said, we want to make sure that developers have the flexibility of saying, hey, I don't want to be served from a cache or I want to be served from origin. And while still making sure that that is as blazingly fast as if they had picked being served from a cache. And that includes adding more tr uh, transformations to the AMP optimizer over time, or even saying that, hey, you have a perfectly valid page and you can actually just decide that I don't want to cache it. So supporting like a valid non-AMP, not a valid non-cached AMP use case while pricing that five times fast. Um, and really strengthening and doubling down on our support, support story for frameworks and CMSs. And this could be actually um, having continue to invest in like the AMP plugin, which is our first class AMP content generation support for WordPress. Um, and then uh, providing starter templates for common frameworks. So say if you wanna pick, say I wanna create an e-commerce site in Next.js using AMP, you shouldn't have to start from scratch. You can just, you should just be able to load a start uh, a template and then just uh, fiddle around with it and you know, get it to where it aligns with your brand values. Um, and then also adding more support for AMP optimizer in different frameworks and CMSs. It was mentioned in the last talk that we have greater support in Next.js, in 11T, as well as in Netlify to like have it on a, a to actually be able to deploy that. We also have support for it in WordPress um, as of April this year, but really finding more frameworks and CMSs that users are finding useful and making sure that we can add AMP optimizer so that they get all of these great uh, transformations that happen on AMP's cache without actually having to think about it, right? We don't want to have to, we don't want developers to be thinking about adding new build steps because that's counter to what, what we want for them to be doing. And to help developers just meet their infrastructure needs, right? If they, if folks have a slightly slower QA process and aren't able to do QA uh, once a week and feel like a month or like four weeks is a better cadence for them, we should have support for that. And that's why we uh, launched the long, 
our LTS release like way early in this year. And we're, we're excited that people are finding it useful, right? BuzzFeed, Tasty, AliExpress have already started using it and more news publishers are starting to think about adopting it, especially as election time comes um, and they have to slow down their QA process just because they want to like go into a code freeze, for example. CSS is something where like AMPS 50 KB limit has always been a, a polarizing, part, uh, a polarizing uh, topic. And that's why we like, we talked to, there was a very long thread where we talked to CMS developers, theme developers, et cetera. And we saw that 75 kilobytes for a limit was really probably the next best option. And that's why we increased the CSS limit. But we also, while that helps developers um, find some little, uh, find a little bit more leeway. We also do want to support them if they want to minify their CSS and provide those tools to be able to do that really well in AMP. And over time, we want to make sure that when you deploy an experience as a developer, you don't have to worry about testing that across different browsers, different mobile devices, et cetera, and that we as the AMP team are making sure that when you do deploy an experience, it looks consistent across as many browsers as we can support or as we do support. Um, Earlier this year, we also launched support for the uh, for CCPA. I don't know what the second C stands for. I should look that up. Um, but yeah, we launched support for CCPA and like consent is something that is going to evolve over 2020 and AMP is going to evolve there with you. And that, that's, some, that, that's the effort that the analytics team has been so great at kicking off. And like even more as more cookie changes, like they've been working on it and that, that, that's, that's our mandate for the, rest of, um, for the rest of time as well and increasing more support for more consent management partners as we see that hey, more developers want um, feel that they need, uh, they need to integrate support, like we have to help them there as well. And great, and all of this come, come boils down to like having these really great components that offer great user experience that is actually grounded in UX. Or, uh, Joey actually showed some like developer research that we've been doing. We've also been, uh, whenever we do release a component, we do user research with, uh, we do user research for that component as well. That could be autocomplete, carousel, et cetera, any new component that we have coming down the pipeline, but also making sure that that component looks consistent across browsers. And then absolutely most importantly, um, making sure that we are staying accessible as we release more components and if we are releasing more components. Um, and then all of that, all of this kind of boils down into really allowing developers to be, be flexible in their approach to creating AMP pages. I talked about how developers had to like always pick between paired AMP and AMP first, and then had to like pick between, like they always had to create a valid AMP page, but now really allowing them to be flexible in the way that they start, hey, you know what, I'm going to get started. I'm going to incorporate a few AMP components into my pages that I think adds value and create a bento AMP page. And once I feel like that's strong enough, I'll maybe add the AMP runtime and create a fully valid AMP page. And then really pick between, hey, do I want to like add, add, the, add an AMP cache and like have a cached AMP page or do I want to like keep my AMP page on origin and like add an optimizer or a CDN, but like, or a CDN, sorry. But like really giving them this flexibility of saying, hey, I don't have to like always think about AMP as a zero to one thing, but as like something I can stop and experiment with um, and see what, what is the right fit for me as a developer, because that, that's what's going to make developers the most productive, like fitting into their current routine. Um, and what that, that's about it. Like that, that's, that's what our focus is for 2020, right? Really helping developers be more productive as long as they, like once they've put in the initial setup, making sure that over time, every month, every week, we're giving them these great updates that they can utilize to really be more productive um, while like not having to add any more costs to their development process, not having to add more engineers to the development process. It's just that simple. Um, so that's, that's our goal for 2020 and beyond, hopefully. With that, that's it.